It's a pleasure to be here and uh, get to see uh, so many friends. Let me make sure this thing works. Uh, who I haven't seen in a while, and I get a chance to talk to people whose work I've read for a while, and uh, just uh, just enjoy the day. Uh, I am going to talk to you about uh, self-regulation failure today. I've been interested in this for most of my career. It's actually what I got interested in graduate school. And today, talking to graduate students uh, from uh, from here, I was saying that one of the exciting things for me is I'm returning to a lot of the questions I had when I was a graduate student. I've sort of, in some ways, come full circle. Um, Christy also mentioned I take a social brain sciences approach. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, well, you know, I was talking with uh, David Geary earlier, but you know, the idea is that the brain solves adaptive problems, uh, that for people, the major adaptive problems, of course, are other people, which for me is my collaborators. Uh, and since they're not here, I can just go right by them uh, really fast. Um, but from an evolutionary context, you know, uh, why control behavior? Well, on the assumption that we have a fundamental need to belong to groups, of course, we want to do things that would get us kicked out of those groups. But what we see is that um, we also, as uh, individuals not considered within groups, are motivated to engage in certain behaviors. And that at some basic level, the reward value we associate with objects in our environment might provide some clue as to their adaptiveness. So the code might be activation of brain reward systems, uh, tell us that that's good for us, we should want that uh, to certain foods and so forth. Uh, and of course, people like Cosmides and Tubies remind us that, of course, uh, you know, we have a Stone Age mind in the 21st century and that you know, uh, adapting as a species, we weren't prepared for food courts uh, or easy, all these great restaurants you have around here uh, you know, where you can just easily go out and get very high fattening uh, food that tastes uh, really, really good. Uh, or, or we can't account for developing drugs that mimic naturally occurring systems. So at some level, we have uh, this reward system that tells us to do things and provides a conflict between our personal desires, shall we say, versus things that would get us into trouble with the group. So at the personal level, we might want to eat a lot, use drugs, force sex, freeload, et cetera. But at the group level, we want to reject people who do all of those things. They're not good for our groups. Uh, so what we really do uh, have is a need to control our behaviors, to regulate, to anticipate and, and think into the future about how people will react to us if we engage in behaviors that would lead us uh, to be rejected. So I talk about self-regulation. I'm really talking about regulation of the self by the self to achieve long-term goals that we can envision in the future. So the fundamental goal, of course, is survival and reproduction. But this ability to self-regulate requires a lot of things. There are a lot of components to being able to self-regulate. We need to be able to set goals, make plans for the future, project ourselves into the future, this sense of autonoetic consciousness. We have to be able to monitor our progress towards those goals, detect errors when we're failing, you know, when we're eating that seventh piece of pie. You know, it's just, something has to tell us to stop. And so we have to figure out ways to stop and inhibit impulses that we have. And what my research has done over the last uh, 25 years or so is try to understand the contexts in which self-regulation fails. Uh, because it often fails. It's a horrible picture. You know, this is self-regulation failure when you have your toddler giving you the beer because you're too passed out. Uh, you know, it's just a bad thing to happen. Uh, and so sometimes self-regulation just gets shut off. I've um, been thinking about this a lot, and in fact, I just published uh, with my student, Dylan Wagner, this uh, review paper in Ticks. I show you this only because it's, I think it's the first time in history that a, a really legitimate uh, premier journal has shown somebody vomiting uh, on its cover. These are, <laughs> this is all manner of self-regulation failure, and uh, I just think it's, it's kind of cool they did that. Um, the approach I've taken over the last uh, decade or so uh, is to use uh, uh, the methods of cognitive neuroscience to, uh, to study various aspects of social cognition. Uh, and of course, what we do is we take somebody like my former student, Jennifer Tickle, uh, put her in the scanner, get a nice picture of her brain. Uh, that is actually her brain, it's a nice brain. Uh, and we look for uh, changes in cerebral activity as measured indirectly by blood flow. Uh, and I like to quote William James a lot. He said, I think everything important. Um, 
He says, we must suppose a very delicate adjustment whereby the circulation follows the needs of cerebral activity. Blood very likely may flow to each region of the cortex according as it is most active, but of this we know nothing. Which sort of sums up, in some ways, where we are in knowing how brain imaging works a little bit. But what we can do is look for patterns of activity and see if they, we can test various theories and models that we have. So how do you do this in an imaging environment? Well, here we have a little bit of something for everybody. Uh, pick your favorite vice, uh, whatever, whatever turns your crank, as we say. For my, one of my colleagues, it's this World of Warcraft where he just gets lost in this uh, for days at a time. We have to go find him, bring him back to the lab. Um, but the way you do this in an imaging environment, I mean, the scanner is a tight little hollow chamber. You can't have people doing a lot of behaviors. Uh, so what we tend to do is show them images of things that are relevant to them that they might have inhibitions about or by, might be trying to regulate, and we see how they respond uh, to those cues. Uh, and I hope to give you a couple examples of how we've used this approach uh, today. Uh, the first I'm going to start with is uh, smoking behavior. Uh, we were interested in trying to understand the neural correlates associated with uh, uh, cigarette craving. And one of the things we, we brought to this was um, the craving literature uh, in, in addiction is kind of a mess. And we think part of this has to do with a lot of the demands placed on people in these studies. So, uh, you know, you'll see an advertisement, wanted cocaine addicts for study on brain reactivity to cocaine cues. You know, so they go in there, they know they're being studied because they're cocaine addicts. They, they know they're going to be shown pictures of cocaine, and lo and behold, they have differential responses to that. Well, the social psychologist in me says, you can't have people aware of exactly what you want to study. That's just not uh, necessarily good science. And so we wondered, what would happen if we had a context in which people had no idea what we were studying? They would, had no idea it was relevant to them. What happens in the brain in that case? So we recruited uh, 17 smokers and 17 non-smokers. They did not know that we knew their smoking status. It was collected in a separate screening to screen out various kinds of things. Uh, no mention was made of the importance of smoking. We just said we had a study that wanted to see which areas of the brain lit up while people watch movies. Uh, seems a convenient cover story. Then they watched 30 minutes of this film, uh, Matchstick Men, starring Nicolas Cage here. Now let me show you. It's a movie that has, in this half hour, the first half hour, it has an awful lot of smoking in it. Uh, this just gives you an idea of uh, some of the sort of typical scenes. So uh, whatever he's doing, there's just a lot of smoking paraphernalia. Um, even, even watching children skateboard, he's smoking. Um, you know, it's just uh, it kind of goes on and on. Um, what we're able to do then, we have them watch this for uh, roughly half an hour. And we can take scenes in which there was smoking, and we can bin those by the, the, the uh, TR in the scanner. We can take control scenes in which the same people were in them without smoking. We have other aspects of the movie that are sort of control, other controls, just sort of baseline responses. And we can ask the question, comparing the smoking scenes to the control scenes, overall for everybody, which areas of the brain are most active? And we see a wide, uh, network of brain areas. This is for both smokers and non-smokers, so we're not biased in which areas we're picking. A lot of areas you see uh, uh, that have been identified in control, reward uh, areas, and uh, this interparacyclus area I'll talk about in a second. But it's important to point out that for each of these, there's much more activity uh, for the smokers than for the non-smokers. Uh, to give you a flavor of this, so we could start with the activity in dorsal anterior cingulate here, found in many of the Q reactivity studies and in previous studies found to correlate with craving. So does it correlate with craving activity in this area? Uh, Post-scanner, so we say how much, you know, if you smoke, how much do you want to have a cigarette? And in fact, we find that um, the more activity we, we saw in response, to, in this area in response to seeing smoking cues, the more they reported uh, wanting a cigarette uh, following uh, uh, the scanning session. But what was more intriguing to us was this area of uh, interparietal sulcus, which at first was a little bit surprising to us, but we, not for long, we started to remember the work that um, people like Scott Frey here and uh, Scott uh, Grafton, when he was at Dartmouth, did on sort of uh, grasping motions. And in fact, uh, from Grafton's lab, Gene Tunick did a meta-analysis of a lot of studies 
uh, where people, where you observe somebody grasping a particular object. Now, these were all right-handed smokers. This is in the left intraparietal sulcus, so it's contralateral control, of course. And in our study, we're talking about basically the exact uh, same area. So we were thinking that this reflects sort of an action representation for the hand gestures involved in smoking. You know, that not only are they getting this reward thing, but they're sort of simulating the hand action, so they're like sharing a cigarette. Well, uh, we published this in Journal of Neuroscience, and it wasn't long before we were spoofed. Uh, the Daily Mass said, seeing a thing makes you think about it, say experts. Uh, <laughs> scientists at the Institute for Studies have established that when human eyes see a thing, the brain will often generate a thought that is in some way related to the thing just seen. Uh, <laughs> We said, we applied the seeing, thinking formula to smoking and found that it followed this pattern. So, okay, it seems a bit obvious, right? You see something, you think about it. But if you're a psychologist, you think, well, maybe it's a bit more uh, sophisticated than that. Maybe, uh, like, that, that, that this, this activity in this area actually means uh, something that we didn't expect. So we could ask a question like, well, you know, if we're right that it's somehow to do with grasping uh, activity or this smoking activity, can we find a way to read out what the mind was thinking during those scenes. If Dan Wagner called it brainovision. Imagine if we could just project what your thoughts were out onto a TV screen. Would, would that tell us what you were thinking? So we used a method, uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but Yuri Hassan uh, did this many years ago called reverse correlational analysis, where you take, when people are watching the movie, the activity and you basically extract the scenes from the movie where you get peak activity. So in other words, if we have activity in this region, what scenes does, the, does this area really care about? Uh, and what would those look like? So these are the scenes uh, in the movie that this area cares about. And I think you'll see that uh, grasping is uh, included in many of them. So there's always some hand object uh, going on, uh, some sort of grasping uh, behavior, holding something to his nose. Uh, grasping himself, uh, you know, but just threw it out. You just kind of can see these. Uh, I don't know if it's a little dark uh, from where you're sitting, but you know, the, a lot of this involves smoking. She's grasping this burger. And so we're seeing this. And we can look at fusiform face area and show you that it really cares about faces because the scenes it peaks at are faces or medial prefrontal and show that it's social interaction that people are caring about. So we're doing a lot with this method. Uh, back to William James, he said, uh, every pulse of feeling which we have is the correlate of some neural activity that is already on its way to instigate a movement. With the idea being, you know, we're bombarded with cues throughout the day that guide our behavior in ways that we're unaware of, that we respond to almost automatically or, or obligatorily. That, and so what we think is happening when, you know, somebody, want, a smoker just, they see these cues of smoking and we talk about subtle cues activating mental goal representations, which can influence behavior. And so the field of social cognition, people like John Barge and App Dijksterhuis have had this whole thing about how these sort of unconscious uh, cues, not subliminal, you can see them, you just don't, aren't aware of them necessarily, can have these subtle effects to, to drive behavior. So if cues actually have some meaning and cause changes in behavior, just showing this, am I giving, you know, and, and looking at how you respond to, say, this piece of food, can that predict something like weight gain uh, over time? So in the next study I want to tell you about, we looked at whether cue reactivity can predict the so-called freshman 15, this weight gain that first-year college students uh, often have. Uh, I, I understand an article came out uh, last week or so saying it's only really four or five pounds. Uh, in our hands, we find it's actually closer to the uh, 12 to 15 we've published on this uh, in the past. Uh, here we said it was five, but we find it somewhere around 10 pounds. Um, so what we did in this uh, study is we brought people into the scanner and we simply had them, we say we're studying social cognition, uh, we're wanting to see how you respond to social scenes. What we want you to do is tell us if, there's, if there are people in the picture or not. Uh, so they see cues, there are no pic people in the picture, no people in the picture, yes there are people, and they're not wearing clothes. Uh, I was telling Chris earlier, NIDA required us to include sex. Uh, honest story, I could, if you want to hear it later, I could tell you. I did get a phone call, 
basically saying, you know, uh, you know, from the program officer asking me how much I like sex, and I thought, you know, what do you have to do to get a grant these days? <laughs> but, um, but yes, your, our, your federal government has asked my lab to look at porn, and we will do that for your sake. Um, so they look at, and they just say, are there people present or not? Uh, they look at all these scenes. Uh, these are all women. These are uh, about 50-some uh, uh, women in their, their first couple of weeks at Dartmouth. Um, they rated each of the things. As you can see, they liked the sex scenes uh, the least, and they knew that because they spent the most time looking at them, okay? <laughs> so it took them a long time to know that they didn't like them. Um, six months later, we could get 48 of them to come back into the lab. We, of course, had weighed them at the first time. We told them that was an important part of being in the scanner. We had to know their weight so we'd know if the bed could get in and out properly. And we brought them back. Six months later, they've had exams, all of this kind of thing. And indeed, this is uh, pounds weight gain and changes in BMI, except for this one person who just lost a ton of weight. Most of the people uh, gained weight on average over six months, seven and a half pounds. Take that out to a year, pretty close to the freshman 15. So which brain areas predicted the weight gain? Well, to cut right to the chase, uh, the nucleus accumbens activity in this brain region in response to food cues, when they had no idea we cared about food cues, robustly predicted uh, weight change over the six months. Um, it wasn't responses to animals or to sexual scenes or to drinking or anything like that. It was specific to food images, okay? So it's nucleus accumbens activity only to food images that's predicting the weight gain. Nucleus accumbens activity in response only to the sex scenes but not the food scenes predicted six months later uh, solitary sexual desire and dyadic sexual desire uh, as well as um, actual sexual behavior. Uh, we asked them to tell us how many partners uh, they'd had since they came to Dartmouth. As you can see, most said zero. Uh, a couple, uh, five or six. Everybody wanted to know who they were. But uh, what we do is just, we, we divide them into ones that are sexually active and ones that aren't sexually active. And what we're seeing is at time one, in response to sexual imagery, the ones who had the most reward were much more likely to be sexually active. The ones who were not sexually active had a slightly decreased response. So in other words, these cues six months earlier are telling us something about how they're responding to cues in their environment. This got us thinking about individual differences in self-regulation. Um, and th th you know, there's a lot of data coming out from uh, social and personality psychology saying that you take even self-control ability in young children and see and it can be quite predictive. Uh, Walter Michel's work showing that uh, delay of gratification at age four predicts important life outcomes like SAT scores and all kinds of things. Uh, t uh, Terry Moffat, Ashlyn Caspi and their Dunedin study showing that early self-control predicts you know, how much money you make and how much money you have saved. You know, we're predicting this based on young children. So when we're thinking about weight gain, there's this question of, uh, we started thinking about, is it because these people have weaker self-control in some way? Is it because they're more responsive to those eating cues? Like what's driving uh, the, the, them to respond to the cues in a way that leads to weight gain? And this is a line of research we're just getting underway. Uh, we just got funded for the first time from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Uh, to look at this, they're very concerned with obesity. And the method we're going to take in this research is to use a method of resting state functional connectivity that Steve Peterson up the road at Wash U uh, has uh, going. It's based on this assumption, it's a heavy an idea, that over the course of development, brain regions that are active together become functionally coupled, the fire together, wire together sort of heavy and learning idea. And uh, over time then, these networks of brain, act, uh, brain regions tend to co-activate. Even when people are at risk, even when people are not performing any other uh, type of task, you'll see these areas activate together. And some people think that there's a common architecture across individuals in, this resting in these various resting state networks that might be in some ways meaningful. And the method we're using, there are a bunch of different ways to look at resting state, uh, uh, functional uh, MRI. Uh, the way we're looking at it is following Steve Peterson's method where you can assess the integrity of that network. And the idea, so the networks might be the same for all people. So you get this default network that people talk about. But the 
connections between the nodes of that network might be quite different for different people. Does the integrity of that network predict something? So in our preliminary, oh, so here's this network. This is, uh, it, I, I like to show this. It, uh, this is from uh, Steve Peterson's lab. Uh, these are nodes in the network changing as children go from about age eight up to 21. And I guess the important thing about this is just, it doesn't matter what the specifics are, but you can see like this is cerebellum down here. These different, this brain is reorganizing. The, these networks are organizing and become more solidified uh, during adulthood where you get this uh, frontal parietal network here, these blue regions, that, and that you can see the strength of the, uh, the connection is the thickness of the lines, sort of uh, using graph theory uh, to assess that. And I guess the important point here is we can define these uh, networks and then look at the integrity of them and say, does that actually predict something? Uh, so what we found in just some preliminary uh, data is that indeed, the frontal parietal and reward networks, the integrity of them, can be used to predict people's BMI. Uh, in other words, people with, uh, who are, like myself, heavier, tend to have weak, more weakly integrated uh, frontal parietal networks. Uh, so we're trying to use that to, this is in the research where we're sort of, uh, so I'm sort of starting in a way, telling you early about the future work, and then I'll get to the main part of the talk. But these are the kind of questions we want to be able to address. So um, do individual differences in the frontal parietal network uh, predict individual differences in things like the capacity to delay gratification? Can we use it to predict? So we all know, you know January 1st is going to come and a lot of people are going to head to the local gyms and join and they're going to join Weight Watchers. And within a month, most of those people will just give up. Can we even predict who even lasts longer than a month? Can, you know, who, who keeps that at? Who, who doesn't? Uh, can we predict uh, who will lose weight? Can we predict weight gain in adolescence? We have another small study we're doing with adolescents where we're trying to see if this predicts uh, weight gain. Uh, does it predict who will fail uh, in self-regulatory tasks we have in the lab? So these are the kind of questions uh, we're asking with that. So how do we, coming back, uh, throughout much of my career, I've uh, studied in the lab how self-regulation fails, often with dieters, I'll tell you about, but sometimes different groups. And we know that there are a number of contexts in which it fails. Uh, how do we study that in a scanner using Q-reactivity? Uh, I like to study eating. It's, it's out of all the things, you know, people are inhibited about a lot of things. But most of them are different, difficult to study in the lab. We have inhibitions for good reasons. And, uh, but eating... It's pretty benign. Uh, everybody eats multiple times a day. Most people inhibit it, at least occasionally. Uh, some people chronically inhibit it, so the chronic dieters. Uh, some people fail to self-regulate and maybe develop weight problems. Uh, and it's pretty easy and ethical to manipulate. Even people who overeat, mostly they know they overeat. It's not uh, shocking to them. Um, and in spite of the fact that more and more people are dieting, I think everybody here is aware that in the United States and much of the uh, world right now, we're seeing an increasing epidemic, if you want to call it that, of obesity in spite of, or for some people to say, caused by uh, the increase in dieting. And as I said, through much of my career, I've looked at a lot of ways that diets fail. Uh, like it, it, there's some similarities if you're in the alcohol field. These are, you know, that self-regulation failure that we seem to see a lot of common causes. So. Uh, having a small amount of alcohol or for eating a forbidden food seems to lead to overconsumption. Uh, ego strength depletion, an idea that uh, Roy Baumeister and I developed, uh, where you view self-regulation as a limited strength. I'll talk about that. Negative affect, we all know, is associated with uh, uh, relapse across a number of addictive behaviors. And, you know, people talk about when they get upset, they eat. Um, we had a model uh, called escape from self-awareness that was one of these. Uh, sort of ideas uh, that we want to study. Um, so when I was a graduate student, we were very interested in seeing what would happen to dieters if we broke their, their diets. Uh, we would measure their chronic dieting on this scale, this restraint scale, how much you're currently dieting, how concerned are you about your weight, and then we'd conduct studies. Now, to, let's, let's put you through this study mentally. We'll take uh, the people in the center. You get to be uh, the control group. You guys are the experimental groups on the outsides. Uh, we tell you, we're interested in a study of the effects of mouth temperature on taste perception. 
This is a perception study, just like visual psychophysics, except this is taste psychophysics, okay? And so we, we have this hypothesis that the temperature in the mouth affects how the tongue works, and it'll affect how your taste experiences are. You've had the experience if your mouth is really cold, you can't taste as well, okay? So to get your mouth to that optimal temperature, we need you to drink a, a, a 16 ounce glass of ice cold water, okay? So you drink this glass of cold water. You're in the control group. In the uh, experimental group, we tell you, you know, we, we have to cool down your mouth. Uh, what we found is like people like to do that in a pleasant way. So what you're going to do is drink this 16 ounce, triple rich, thick chocolate milkshake in the next five minutes, okay? So you're all gonna have a milkshake. So imagine, if you will, consuming this very tasty, but very large milkshake. And then we say, okay, your mouth is now at the optimal temperature. Uh, we now want you to do the taste rating task, which involves uh, tasting uh, ice cream. Uh, we're, and so you sit in front of three uh, big bottle, or big tubs of like Baskin Robbins uh, ice cream. You scoop some out, you taste it, you rate it. You scoop some out, you taste it, you rate it. And so on and so forth. Of course, uh, we say to them, oh, you have 10 minutes to do this. By the way, if you finish early, you just go ahead and help yourself. We've got freezers full of ice cream. We're just going to throw it all out at the end of the experiment. So just help yourself. But don't change your taste ratings, okay? Those are the science part. So we leave them alone with the ice cream uh, for 10 minutes. And of course, we've weighed all the ice cream before. We weigh it after. We assume that anything missing isn't in their pockets, <laughs> that they've actually uh, consumed it, so we know uh, how much they ate. So uh, what do you typically find? Well, in the control condition, you folks in the center, uh, if you were non-dieters, you ate quite a bit of ice cream. Makes sense. You're not dieting. You're college students. It's free food. You eat a lot of it. Uh, if you were dieters, though, you didn't eat as much. Makes sense. You're dieting. You're not supposed to eat a lot of ice cream. After the milkshake, you guys on the outside, imagine how you feel. You've had the 16-ounce chocolate milkshake. Maybe you're kind of feeling a little full, right? So if you're a non-dieter, you uh, didn't eat very much. Makes sense. You're full. The question is, what do the dieters do? Uh, does their eating go down? Does it stay the same? Or... Uh, does it do this, which is uh, <laughs> technically known as the what the hell effect. Uh, diet's blown, what the hell, I'm just going to eat. It's, it's ice cream, and they just eat a lot of food. Uh, the same pattern since uh, Herman Palvey uh, demonstrated it in the 70s has been shown in multiple labs around the world. So we thought, how do you get this into the scanner? Because the ice cream's going to kind of melt. But we thought of how we would do it. Here is our cover story. This is the other thing social psychologists have brought to cognitive neuroscience, better cover stories, okay? So we say, uh, here's our problem in our lab, we say to the subject. We are interested in studying social cognition, but there's a big problem with imaging studies, and it's this. That's not a hole in the brain. That's called signal dropout or artifact. And this is actual signal dropout or artifact that Scott could tell you about is a common problem because of the nasal uh, sinuses, just somehow affects the, the signal. And it's really difficult to scan uh, this region of the brain. You can do it, and there are various methods that people have employed to do it. So I said to the subjects, we're testing out some methods. And in some labs, you're getting these graphite uh, bite bars that you bite down on. It's really uncomfortable, though, which is something they're really doing. We said, but we have this hypothesis that if we could change the temperature of your sinus cavities, that would affect the signal quality. So how are we gonna do that? Well, <laughs> you're going to drink a beverage that's very cold. For the control subjects, you're gonna drink a big glass of cold water, which you do. And for the other subjects, we found that people like, you know, pleasurable thing, so we're gonna give you a milkshake to drink in five minutes. That'll get your sinuses to the right temperature, and we're gonna see how that affects the signal as you process images and tell us whether there are people in them or not. So once again, are, no nude pictures this time, just are there people present? And some of the times are pictures of very attractive foods that people might find appealing, uh, pre-tested. Uh, I have a student from Montreal obsessed with bagels, uh, so we always have to have bagels in them. But essentially this conforms to a standard two by two design. Uh, and I'll mention that this is a study we used 100 uh, subjects, 25 in each condition because we wanted to make sure we had uh, enough power. Oops, so we had uh, you know, 25 dieters having water, 
in non-dieters, water, milkshake, and milkshake. So what do we find? Again, we looked for uh, regions of the brain that showed this uh, interaction. So here, I'm going to start those in the control condition with the water. Uh, this is the same finding in right nucleus accumbens and left nucleus accumbens. I'm just going to point to this upper one. Uh, so what we found is the non-dieters showed robust activity to the food images. It makes sense. That's what we expected to find. What we didn't expect to find, and I think is very interesting, is this absence of reward signal in the dieters. Now again, they don't know that food's relevant, but they're, they're you know, I, I would have assumed that if you show an appetitive stimulus to any subject, you'd at least get some reward signal. They were doing something to shut that out, which I think is interesting. We don't know exactly what they're doing. Here's after the milkshake for the non-dieters. Look at that. After a 16 ounce milkshake, those food pictures aren't seem to giving uh, much of reward activity at all. What did we find in the dieters? Bang. After the 16 ounce milkshake, now those food images look pretty good. In other words, now we're getting a reward signal of some sort, perhaps, but only after they've already had this uh, big hedonic milkshake. Uh, and basically, that, that sort of mirrors the behavioral findings, uh, where it's after the milkshake that you get uh, this activity. We did find, oh, and I should mention, it was specific to food images. Again, we want to show it's not some generalized response. When they saw pictures of puppies, they didn't get this uh, activity. We did see a reverse uh, interaction in the amygdala, which if there are amygdala experts uh, here or somebody has some ideas, I'd love to hear them. We still haven't exactly sorted out how to think about this. But essentially what we saw was that for dieters, they showed more activity in the amygdala to food images in the control condition. That response went down after a milkshake, whereas for non-dieters it went the other way. You know, if, if some simple-minded view of the amygdala is it's a fear center, it's like here they're afraid of food, there they're not, here they're not afraid of food, now after a milkshake they are. I don't know, we're very interested uh, to think about that a little bit more. But what we basically found in this first study is that the milkshake preload uh, interferes with the diet that restrained eaters we knew from the lab eat more ice cream after a milkshake. Uh, dieters normally show, uh, uh, what we found, as little cue reactivity to the attractive food cues. And I really think there must be something interesting going on there that we need to find out. Like, what are they doing so automatically uh, when they see food? Is somehow, are they ignoring it? Is it an intentional thing? We're just not really sure. But following the milkshake, they showed uh, this increased cue reactivity that's associated with uh, self-regulatory failure in the real world. I mentioned the strength model of self-regulation, another uh, way we've tried to look at uh, self-regulation failure that uh, Roy and I talked about uh, back in 96. The idea here is that there are individual differences in uh, this sort of, uh, this resource, this, that, that, that self-regulation re re uh, depends on this resource you have, and it, just like a muscle, Roy used the muscle analogy, it can become depleted, fatigued. Uh, so it can be increased with practice over development, but it can be momentarily depleted, uh, fatigued. It can overwhelming cues we talked about could deplete it. Um, and importantly, our model talks about it affecting subsequent rather than concurrent efforts. So you become depleted and then, you know, it's like after a long day of making a lot of decisions, you get home and somebody says, what do you want to eat? And you go, oh, I, I couldn't decide. You know, I just, I can't make any decisions now. I'm just spent. Uh, and that's sort of the phenomenological aspect of it. But once again, William James, uh, the man who has daily inured himself to the habits of concentrated attention, energetic volition, and self-denial in unnecessary things, will stand like a tower when everything rocks around him and his softer fellow mortals are winnowed like shaft in the blast. I said the same thing, just not as well uh, as that. So uh, we have done some research in the past showing that uh, having people, we can deplete people, and it will affect their ice cream. With Kath, my former student, Kathleen Voss, uh, in a study we published in Psych Science, we had uh, dieters complete this task where they watched this really sad scene from ter Terms of Endearment where the, this little boy, the mother's dying of cancer, he's saying goodbye to her for the last. It's very sad. And for the ones, some of them in the depleted condition, we made them sort of suppress all emotional experience here. Don't feel anything while you watch this. The other group could feel whatever they wanted. Uh, then we said, oh, by the way, now we're going to have you do this taste test. I can't remember exactly how we connected them, but we did. 
and we looked at how much uh, food they ate. Uh, this is still in my social psychology days before I discovered air bars. Uh, but what you can see here is that the group in the depletion condition indeed consumed a lot more ice cream uh, than the control group. So how do we deplete people in the scanner? Uh, here, uh, my student Dylan Wagner uh, helped develop this technique where we're going to uh, deplete people or not by having them do this task I'll show you, or not deplete them, and then we'll do standard food cue reactivity. Are there people in the scenes or not? To do uh, the depletion task, we had them come in and say, we're interested in attentional networks. Uh, we're going to track your eye movements in the scanner and see what you, uh, what you look at in these movie scenes. And then we develop this uh, sort of like the old-fashioned bogus pipeline. We say, OK, uh, what we want you to do when you see a light is to look at it. And as soon as you fixate on it, it will turn red. Then you'll see another dot, look at it until it turns red, and so on and so forth. So people are looking, and then it turns red. Then they look, it turns red. They look, it turns red. OK, we're just making this up. You're not looking, but they believe this. It's in about the time course they would normally use. So they think we know where they're looking. In the depletion condition, we're saying, you're going to watch this little film. Words are going to appear on the screen. Do not look at the words, OK? It's very important you don't look at the words. Control condition, we just said you can look at the words if you want. But we said, well, now we know where you're looking, so don't look at the words. And then onto the screen, this is from the National Film Board of Canada. It's on bighorn sheep. Uh, we used it to induce neutral mood in people. It's very neutral mood inducing. <laughs> So try not to look at the word, don't look at the word, don't look at the word, don't look at the word, <laughs> okay? We had a lot of trials of this, don't look at the word, don't look at the word, okay? No matter what it does, don't look at the word, okay? And so they do this for uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, and then we look at areas that show greater uh, reactivity to the food cues, and indeed there are a number of areas. Across all these key reactivity studies, we tend to see activity in two major regions. And uh, Hedy Kober at uh, Yale is just publishing a meta-analysis on this. One is the ventral striatal region, the uh, nucleus accumbens, as I mentioned. The other is a, an area of the medial orbital frontal cortex that seems, for whatever reason, to be uh, highly active in some of these studies. Uh, we get it about half the time. We, get, we either get accumbens predominantly or OFC. We're not sure why. Uh, it turns out in studies where we actually give people food or something, we tend to see a Cummins. If we don't, and it's just a, a manipulation like this, we tend to see OFC. In this study, we saw the medial orbital activity. And it was greater for the depletion group than for the control group, which sort of goes along, uh, now with hair bars intact, uh, this finding that they eat more ice cream when they're depleted than when they uh, are not. Here, again, we're showing more robust Q reactivity in uh, brain reward regions in response uh, to um, uh, the depletion manipulation. We had people report at the end how difficult they found the task, how fatiguing they found the task. And what we found, uh, oh, we also got, it wasn't quite significant. In the left and right of Cummins, we got the same pattern. We just got more variability in it. But we asked people, how depleted did you feel? For the people in the control group, the level that they felt depleted or fatigued had no correlation with activity. But for the, group, the people in the depletion group, the more depleted they felt, the greater the signal uh, we saw in, in this brain region, which gives us some, uh, I think, purchase that it's, it's this feeling of fatigue that might be important. OK, the final uh, disinhibitor I want to talk to you about is emotional distress. Uh, I love this picture. You're just screaming into the phone and eating pizza. Um, again, if we look across a number of different uh, areas, a frequent cause of relapse or a frequent cause of disinhibited behavior is emotional distress, whether it's drinking, drug use, smoking, disinhibited eating. You know, when people are upset, they go shopping. When people are upset, they gamble. When people are upset, they use drugs. You know, negative affect seems to drive uh, a lot of self-regulation failure. And indeed, this was my doctoral dissertation where we use different ways to make people feel anxious or distressed. And dieters ate more, and non-dieters tended to eat less uh, after we uh, got them emotionally upset. And we did this in a number of different ways. So how do you induce mood in the scanner? You don't really get them to watch Star Trek, but I, I think this 
shows a, a hint of what we tried to do. <laughs> okay, so just like this, we want to do something to let Spock let go, self-regulation failure. We want to slowly induce a negative mood. So what we used is a modification of something called the Velton Mood Induction Procedure, Velton from 1968, where you start with reading a series of statements and they get more and more negative, like uh, today is neither better nor worse than any other day. Actually, I'm feeling a bit down today. Actually, and it gets more and more gloomy till finally it's like, I just want to put my head down and never wake up. Okay, and you sort of guide yourself through this. Uh, in the neutral condition, you read a series of statements like, Utah is the beehive state. Uh, you know, refrigerators use lots of electricity. Uh, and you just read those. Uh, we modify this slightly uh, to be social uh, distress manipulation where you start off, uh, some people like me and some people don't like me. Well, actually, a lot of people don't like me, and then it just gets more and more gloomy to, you know, everybody hates me, and I have no friends. Uh, so they sort of get into that, and again, so we induce this mood in them, and then we look at Q reactivity. Uh, we measured pre- and post-self-esteem. Uh, the social stress manipulation did, in fact, lower their self-esteem, as symbolized by the important uh, crying smiley face. Um, but uh, again, in the medial orbital frontal cortex, the social group showed increased activity to these food uh, cues following this distress in a way that, you know, here's the depletion, here's the negative mood. What we're seeing is in all cases that we see, you know, for dieters when they've eaten an ice cream, when they've been depleted, when you give negative affect, you see now food even when they're not expecting it, seems to take on these rewarding characteristics. Uh, here we showed that the change in self-esteem was associated with the more they had a drop in self-esteem, the more we saw this increase in the reward value. Uh, same with the accumbens, okay? So it wasn't a big effect uh, there, but the more the self-esteem dropped in the social distress condition, the more reward value they seemed to derive from the food. Okay, so these things are, are happening to make food seem maybe more appealing. Dylan Wagner and I published in the Trends in Cognitive Science this sort of model as we summarize the field that we, just got, to, we got really giddy excited about this uh, as only you know, people like ourselves can get giddy excited. Uh, as we started to think about, now this is one of the oldest uh, ideas around that there's some sort of tension, a reciprocal interaction between frontal control mechanisms and subcortical reward mechanisms. I mean, this has almost been around since Adam and Eve, right? And every neuroscience uh, just knows that, you know, and people talked about the battle between, you know, subcortical rises up. Uh, Mark Rakel and his colleagues have found uh, with Wayne Drevitz that it does almost seem to, in many cases, be very tightly connected. So for whatever reasons, the subcortical reward and emotion regions go up, seems to be associated with the reduction in frontal lobe functioning. Similarly, if you wipe out frontal lobe functioning, say with an injury uh, or uh, some other way, alcohol, you know, suddenly cues become more potent. Uh, so we're not the first to say that by a long shot. Uh, and, you know, I was just listening to uh, Amy uh, uh, Arneston from Yale talk about, you know, in primate models, they show that stress leads to reduction in prefrontal uh, attentional and executive function areas. But what we th thought was that the nature 
of the self-regulation failure, what we really have to do is think about whether it's having its influence on the bottom-up approaches versus top-down. So the first thing we, you know, cue exposure, like in the smoking, we thought, you know, that makes the bottom-up sort of tilts in favor of the cues. Same with lax uh, activated consumption, the, the milkshake preloads, or abstinence violation effects, you know, might uh, be having an effect. Whereas things like we thought maybe resource depletion or negative mood inductions would actually be associated with dampening frontal resources. Uh, and I would add to that escape from self-awareness. Uh, another line of research in our lab has looked at uh, self-referential uh, processes when you're processing information about the self. Uh, we see activity in medial prefrontal cortex. Uh, and so in, in a number of studies, that seems to be an indicator of self-awareness. So if we're, if we're somehow wiping out your sense of self, like that mindless eating you might do at a movie where you just, where did that bucket of popcorn go? You know, where you haven't been paying, if you haven't been monitoring your behavior, you see sort of a, a disinhibited behavior. So in our model, um, why I think I got excited about, oh, this is to show it's not a, a, a new idea about the role of frontal lobes. This is Freeman and Watts who did the studies that led to uh, lobotomy. Uh, they wrote uh, in 1939, the frontal lobes are not centers of intelligence nor of emotion, nor are they directly concerned with the energy drive of the individual. They assemble the available data, synthesize them, plan a course of action with the ideal in mind, and equipped with energy of response and with appropriate effective tone, project the individual into the future direct him towards his goal and criticize his shortcomings. That's what, what we've been talking about, self-regulation, all these things, like a, with the appropriate energy of response, the strength model is there. You know, Moniz comes along, sees these guys talk and develops the lobotomy, right? So if you wipe out, what happens? And uh, we talk about, uh, this is, a, by the way, the, the finding the self study we did uh, showing this area of medial prefrontal cortex. We know from a, a, a lot of work that, um, Weakening of frontal restraint. Uh, it was actually Car oops, Carlisle uh, Jacobson uh, from Yale, an early neuroanatomist that talked about, he was the one to use that term stimulus bound nature, that animals without frontal lobes become stimulus bound. Frontal lobe uh, dysfunction syndromes talk about utilization syndrome, right? Where they reach out and they'll do the things next to them. So from our model, there are many roads to disinhibition. I don't think it's coincidental We've tended to, in the field, treat these things as if they're doing different things. Emotions doing one thing, depletions doing another. Giving somebody alcohol makes them drink too much, you know. But from our model, disinhibition is a generalized, non-domain specific mental state in which somehow the frontal lobes are, are weakened somehow, or the frontal mechanisms become weakened. And then disinhibition leads to release of inhibited behavior. Now, which behaviors get disinhibited are those that individuals are inhibiting, okay? So we won't be able to predict how you'll behave until we know what you're trying not to do. If you're a dieter, you're trying not to eat. Maybe Bruce is trying not to do something. We, we can speculate. But if we, we, you know, if he was disinhibited, we'd see it, right? And it's almost tragically sad and ironic that when people are disinhibited, they end up doing the very thing they're trying hardest not to do, right? If they're an alcoholic, they're disinhibited, they drink. If somebody else goes shopping or spends too much money, buys too many neckties, you know, why don't people who drink go buy neckties and the necktie buyers go have a drink? It's not, it doesn't work that way. So what our model says is we have to have some recognition that although uh, the capacity for self-regulation and its disinhibition might be domain general, that you have to understand the context of individual specificity to understand the behavior you'll see. And it also depends on the situational cues. And what we argue here, based on this idea of uh, people with weakened frontal becoming stimulus bound, is that in a situation where you're faced with tempting foods, you're more likely to consume them. If, if you're in response to something that makes you angry. So from other work, we know that depleted people, if they're looking at those IAPS pictures, depleted people show hyper response to negative IAPS images in the amygdala. It seems to intensify the emotional experience. 
And so when I go to the literature and I see things like Claude Steele's alcohol myopia theory or Stanley Schachter's externality theory or the old social psychological concept of deindividuation and the behavioral consequences of these things, to me these are all telling a very similar story, the story of this domain uh, general uh, inhibitory frontal system and then context specific and individualized release of the behaviors uh, that, that will depend on where you're at. So why I'm sort of excited is when I uh, went to be a postdoc with Roy Baumeister, it was this notion of generalized disinhibition that I wanted to devote my career to studying. But something, we got sidetracked onto other things. I think we were trying to figure out how to test the theory and I don't know, we thought of having people who like eat popcorn while they watch naughty movies or something and the IRB wouldn't let us do that and neither would my wife. And so we got onto other things and I, somehow I forgot about this idea and just went on to other things and it's only after the way I said I got giddy happy writing this paper is all of a sudden all the things I was most excited about in graduate school now start to make sense to me where at the time I thought there's something there but I just didn't understand uh, how it might work. Uh, but I now know uh, that uh, self-control is important but it's also not always the best thing to do. And with that I'll say thank you and take some time to answer questions. Yeah, Bruce, you're going to tell us what you're inhibited about? I was about to say, if everybody shows up to the reception later, you might get to see inhibitory failure. But um, I wanted to, uh, first of all, say uh, it's really very cool uh, and <coughs> relates to some of the things you've been thinking about in my lab. And one thing that we've been working on a little bit is kind of a, a model of self-regulatory control that in some way incorporates kind of Cognition interfacing with emotion. And I'm wondering if you've thought at all about kind of the role of affect in some of these self regulatory failures and successes. Yeah. So I was asked to repeat questions so, uh, for the camera, and the thing to repeat is Bruce said this was very cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, no. Ad, uh, he asked about the role of uh, affect in this, and I, you know, so we, there are a lot of theories about the anterior cingulate cortex and how it's related to affect. Uh, in, in, uh, there have been some talk about the dorsal anterior cingulate being involved in some. In our hands, we tend to find ventral anterior cingulate uh, being much more uh, relevant and important. I think that's the area where, say, Helen Mayberg uh, goes in with her deep brain electrodes and finds that a good treatment uh, for, for treatment-resistant depression. Uh, and so that area makes a lot more sense to me. Uh, you know, we're, one of the the issues that you probably, if you were paying attention, noticed is we, we're not seeing a lot of control mechanisms in any of these studies. We get hints, we've seen some, uh, some uh, lateral PFC, we've seen some, uh, some areas of anterior cingulate, uh, we've seen a little bit of VM PFC, some of these areas, uh, but not consistently, which is one of the reasons we actually thought for the frontal stuff, we're more interested in the resting state functional connectivity as uh, something that, because in the real world, you don't, you know, in an event-related design, like our cues, you know, it's like every few seconds you see something. But that's not how regulation works, where people, you know, over long spans of time develop self-control. Uh, so, you know, I don't know that the event-related fMRI is the way to get at some of these uh, kinds of questions. And maybe that's why we're not seeing those. Not sure if that's exactly answering your question. I mean, the affect stuff we're interested in, we now have this first study. Uh, but we'll be looking at, you know, I, I, I am intrigued and I want to read more from the, the, the primate literature uh, all that had all the studies showing that uh, anxiety, however they induce anxiety, they don't probably show them Star Trek to monkeys, but when they make them anxious, you get disruption of executive functions. So something's happening there to interfere with executive functions, uh, which I view as sort of analogous uh, to, to, to what we're talking about in, in this domain general self-regulatory resource. Yeah. Uh, try to keep my question short enough to re me repeat it. But, <laughs> um, in most of your phenomena, uh, the pathway of causation seems to be that the, uh, that the behavior is causing the depletion of this inhibitory resource. And, uh, but the one exception seems to be the way you're thinking of where the causation seems to be that the state of the mind or brain 
level in some way that is, in other words, affecting the brain directly right. uh, and affecting the inhibition capability. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Roy uh, Baumeister and John Tierney have a book out right now called uh, Willpower that's getting a lot of press. And uh, they actually cite a study that I presented during the presidential symposium at SPSP uh, where we used a glucose manipulation. Uh, we've since discovered as we're preparing it for publication that it's not as good a story as we wanted to tell. You should always do your more care. That's the one problem when you say, oh, we've got this great new finding, and then you go back and you say to the graduate student, okay, it's now been all over the New York Times and it's in this book, we better get it out the door. And, uh, <laughs> pain, from, no, that's stress. Uh, but, so Baumeister's theory is that depletion relies, uh, or th that self-regulatory strength relies on glucose, and if you disrupt glucose, you can cause those effects. Um, and, I mean, some physiologists say that, that, that that's an implausible model. Uh, I'm skeptical of it, as well why we ran a study. Uh, certainly, people who are dieters are resisting food a lot, and, and that might be depleting in its own right. Uh, so, I, I think, ultimately, much of this, I, I would say, when I, you know, depletion or anxiety, uh, overeating, I mean, I think it's just a response to an environmental thing. It tells you, though, why dieting is so difficult. Um, <laughs> dieters are great at not eating until anything happens to them, okay? Uh, if they get upset, they eat. If they get depleted, they eat. If they have a bit of food, they eat. If they're happy, they eat because then they don't think about their diet anymore. It's like, when do they diet? You know, when they're drinking water. Uh, it's this very small period of time when they're consuming water that they manage uh, to diet. And I think that that's the understanding, is that all of these are situations thrust upon them, which makes, uh, but I bet if we looked at alcoholics, we'd see a very similar thing. They, they drink when they're stressed, they drink when they're around other, when they get cues for drinking, that all of these things conspire uh, for people with addictive habits and behavioral dysregulation. To me, the thing is, each lab studying like the effects of stress on alcohol or the effects of cues on alcohol or absence violation effects, you know, they're, maybe we're all talking about the same thing. And it's whatever happens to change the balance between the frontal and the subcortical. It, whether it's from the bottom up effects of subcortical or whether uh, it's the absence of, uh, or the breaking down of the top down regulatory control. And that thinking in that way gives you some hypotheses I don't think you would otherwise have if you would stuck into your, your more narrow field, which probably didn't even come close to answering your question. But. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had that, uh, that uh, discussion with Baumeister when I first pointed out to him the implausibility of the glucose hypothesis was, you know, is based on the fact we give milkshakes and dieters overeat, it just doesn't match. But we're thinking that dieters overeat, it's a cognitive thing. So if we give them this milkshake and tell them it only has 100 calories in it, they don't overeat. If we give them a 100 calorie milkshake and tell them it has 1,000 calories, they do overeat. It's why dieters, will view their diets intact when they have a 1,400 calorie Caesar salad, because it's a salad, but if they have a 200 calorie chocolate bar, their diet's gone. You know, it's, it's, this, it's this wacky thinking rather than the, because the, your body doesn't track it sufficiently fast, I think. But in terms of building self-regulatory strength, that's an open question. Mark Moraven has maybe one study showing you can build up self-regulatory strength, but we don't know how long that would take to happen. So there's this line of research that compares musicians uh, to non-musicians. And it turns out, in, in various measures of brain integrity of, uh, of networks and stuff, musicians show a lot of advan advantages in like executive functions and stuff. One could argue that hours of training and practice, regular practice of musical skills, institutes 
some form of self-regulatory strength, that they're building the analogous muscle through music training or other, any task that requires this, like, like William James said, you know, this regular self-discipline over time. We are hoping we can capture that with the resting state functional connectivity measures. Because we, that's what we're saying. We don't think that reveals itself in this standard event-related fMRI uh, sort of design. So of course, this, this latest grant we just got, our first step is to see whether resting state predicts who will be successful um, at, at go, go, joint, you know, going to a gym or losing weight and whether it predicts some of this lab stuff. But ultimately, it would be nice to say, you know, what if we could measure uh, resting state and find that some people we can identify them as unlikely to succeed in a gym on their own. Could we randomly assign them to a trainer who would regularly help them? You know, and, and so are there ways to build this self-regulatory strength? Can you change resting state functional connectivity in a way that builds this frontal parietal network? I mean, you know, this is very early days where we're just going to see if it has any meaning at all. But ultimately, it'd be nice to see if we could build sort of a resistance that might suggest strategies of, of you know, learning to play the piano to help people, uh, you know, I don't know. But that's probably when they're just when they're kids. But something where you have to engage and build self-regulatory resources. Yes? Right. And um, I'm wondering what stage in the dieting process are these dieters? Are, are, are you getting people who have just started dieting or have they been to Right. So the question is that, and it is, I think, one of the more fascinating pieces of data that we don't understand. So in the control condition where they just had water, wh why didn't they respond to the food cues? And the question is, how, who are these dieters? Were they people just undertaking a diet? These are what we call chronic dieters. These are people who have, you know, the interesting thing, some people just are always on a diet. And it's, um, we've, in, in the world, real world, we, I did a study once where we took people who were chronic dieters and took people who weren't dieters, and we weighed them every day for six weeks, and then again at intervals over time. And what we found was that uh, both the dieters and the non-dieters, at the end of six months, weighed the same. But the non-dieters did this, <laughs> whereas the dieters did this. So over the six months, they're you know, binging and purging, binging and purging, you know, or they're over breaking their diets, there's dieting, they're, they're, they're struggling with food and controlling what they eat constantly. They don't tend to lose weight over time. So, but they get into this situation where chronic dieting leads you to be insensitive to internal states, and so your eating becomes reliant on you know, cognitive cues such as, you know, uh, I can have so many calories. or That's why we think the what the hell effect is, you know, once your diet's blown, you just eat because you've, you know, you don't have satiety holding back eating because you've habituated. I mean, when you first start dieting, you're hungry all the time. If you're not, you're not being a good dieter, right? But we habituate to anything like that. So the normal cues that would guide behavior are just absent. So in terms of what they're doing, though, I just, I don't know. They, they, they're, they're managing somehow to not be processing that, those food cues in a way that signifies a reward value. No, it's a 10-item scale, the restraint scale, with different questions of how often are you dieting, how much would you be affected by a five-pound uh, weight gain, uh, how much does your weight fluctuate? How concerned are you for your... So it's a series of questions. Uh, many chronic dieters are currently on a diet. What we haven't studied before is people who just for the first time go on a diet, and that's the group we're trying to capture now. So when they've just decided to go on a diet, get this resting state functional connectivity, can we predict whether they even stay on it for a month or so? If they stay on it, how much they lose and that kind of thing. And we'll also be measuring Q reactivity in them. So we'll see, you know, we'll, we'll test those things against each other. Does the, the extent to which they're responsive to food cues also predict whether they stay on their diet or whether how much weight they lose if they diet? So that's, that's the goal is to try and do that. Yeah.
That's the one thing we're trying. There's a thing called the weight suppression index that's supposed to, that is a measure of successful dieting. And if those people look different, uh, they're at Brown University, they have a group they're studying of successful long-term dieters. Some of these people are extreme in that the hours of exercise uh, they do. And, or we could, you know, maybe I could just, you know, find the biggest loser long-term uh, people. What I'd like to do is, is bring these people back if they lose weight or not uh, and do more resting state functional connectivity, more Q exposure, and see if subsequently you've changed the dynamics of the system and uh, if they've managed to do, to do something. Uh, many successful dieters are people who just you know, got a little fat and lost, went back and lost it again rather than people who have like, chronic weight issues over time. We don't really know a lot. Part of the problem is the people who successfully lose weight on their own seldom come to our attention, right? They don't go to, that was Stanley Schachter's point on his recidivism paper, is that, yeah, people lose weight on their own, but you wouldn't know that from the clinics because it's the people who can't on their own that we tend to see. So putting out an ad, have you successfully lost weight, then you'd have to verify it. I mean, it's a great idea and ultimately something we'd like to do, but I think it's identifying those people and finding a way to assess them. That might be a bit more tricky. Well, thank you all very much for coming out, and thanks for having me here. Again, it was a very wonderful time. <laughs>